Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number seven of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Zero, because my mother always said I wouldn't amount to nothing. And I'm here with my refined co-host, a man who gets aggressively pursued by women half his age, a man who is the talk of the town, but he doesn't even reside in your town, the Silverback, a.k.a. Gorilla of House Street, VWAP Trader. I'm talking about JJ. JJ, how's it going? Good, brother. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing very well, very well. And, uh, you know, coming off, uh, you know, a fun episode we did last week, uh, you know, with best-selling author, Tony Duff, you know, very smart, funny, witty guy. Uh, yeah, man, what, what were your impressions? Uh, it was it was great having the Duff on the on the show. It uh, it brought back a lot of really good memories for me, and uh, it, it's nice to always have someone come from the other side of the desk, you know, to tell people what really kind of goes on, um, you know, with with these fund managers and and traders at funds. Yeah, no, yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's good to get some of uh, you know, especially for I know like a lot of our listeners, you know, most of our listeners from the retail side, you know, just get them to see what goes on on the other side of things. And um, yeah, if you guys haven't uh, listened to that, highly recommend it. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Um, and also a uh, reminder that if you guys um enjoy our podcast, uh, me and JJ would greatly appreciate it. Uh, whatever you guys are listening to it, just rate and review it for us. Um, and so, yeah, today let's jump right into um, our topic. Uh, we're going to be discussing, you know, common questions uh, and common phrases uh, that new traders often hear. Um, and JJ, I know that you work with a lot of people, you know, one on one, and, and he, these are some of the things that uh, you hear. Um, and so, we're going to address them because um, they're very important. And so, starting off first. Um, you know, even my, you know, I think back to when I first started learning, you know, this was like one of the first things I think people get taught and get heard um, is, you know, trade your plan, trade your plan. Um, what exactly does that mean, JJ, to trade your plan? Well, this is something that I had never heard in 20 years on the other side, trade your plan. And it was something that I kind of learned the hard way because uh, I came into the market and I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing. This is no big deal, right? You know, I'll just sell some here and average up and do this and that. And next thing you know, I'm I'm down a couple of hundred bucks, scratching my head, going, "Oh, okay, I'm, maybe I'm not so smart." Mm-hmm. Um, and then I uh, I stumbled upon a guy uh, by the name of Trader Dante who, who was explaining how to trade a plan. And I watched some of his stuff, and I figured out um, it's just a part of the process of having certain targets either up or down depending on what kind of market you're in the context of the market you're in um, knowing kind of where you would execute and why you would execute you know having context behind your executions which the profile will help you see um, and also risk management um, you know knowing that you know if you put in a buy somewhere and you know structurally that that buy is going to get violated with a sell order having you know having the decency to your account uh to respect it enough to you know honor your stops and put a stop in and exercise proper risk management all of those sorts of things um are part of a trade plan it is kind of confusing for new traders because people will say trade your plan trade your plan but they don't know how to build a plan because they don't mm. know what they're doing yet. Right. right. So it, it is confusing. Cause I heard that all the time too. And, you know, um, I was like, trade your plan. Okay. Well, I got to come up with a plan and then, but you know, when you don't understand the context of the market that you're trading in and the subtleties of it, um, or even the basic mechanics of it, um, it's pretty hard to put a trade plan together. Um, A lot of people come in and they'll try and exercise a plan based on somebody else's trading. And I tried that and it didn't work for me because, you know, obviously I had different um, risk tolerances and, you know, maybe my nerves weren't so good as somebody who's 25, you know, who can sit there and take six, uh, six handles of, uh, of, on a stop loss um, or lose $600 a day trading uh, and say, oh, it's no big deal. 
Um, so it, it's very, um, it's sort of an evolving process, you know, uh, mm -hmm. training your plan. As you learn, your plan becomes more detailed or it becomes more flexible that allows you to take advantage of the uh, information the market is generating. Right, right. Now, you talk about like, you know, it being very confusing at first, you know, following other people. So in, in which is probably not recommended. Um, so how does a new one go about developing a trading plan? Well, I would first look at the market that you're trading. Um, are you trading equities? Are you trading futures, commodities? And then I would seek out information in that market to learn the mechanics of it and what makes it move back and forth, right? Um, you know, the U.S. equity market, most of these markets are based on order flow. Um, and so I would look to things like market profile and market structure and base a plan, um, you know, as the great Jim Dalton says, where you have a structural entry, a structural exit and a structural stop. Um, and that way you can take advantage of better trade location. It just, you know, to, to put one together now, I'm not the best detail guy in the world. So my trade plan I come into today based on looking at what the overnight has done. I trade in the day time frame. I don't swing, trade, or hold positions very long. So I trade in the day time frame, and I will look at if the overnight inventory is long, whether it's short, will there be a correction? Um, and then I'll look at the internals that Peter taught us about to see you know, when we do have a big gap or a gap like we did today, is that gap going to hold? Or did they just gap it up so they can sell stock into it? um you know and create buyers um so all of those things are the context but if you don't know what's going on in the market or why the market exists it's kind of hard to put a plan together so the first thing i would tell people is learn why this market exists it exists to sell you something that we have bought cheaper right just like any market right mm -hmm. uh, you know and you are our exit strategy so our goal is to sell you as much as we can at the highest prices we can for as long as we can, right? And then the wholesaler's function is to, when you get tired of holding or scared of holding, to buy it back from you at a cheaper price because they've sold it to you short. So just things like that, the mechanics, if you start understanding the underlying mechanics, you'll be able to start formulating a plan based on um, actual supply and demand and things like that and, and, and just common sense. Um, you know, um, I don't really have a really, really detailed trade plan. I will look at the market and look at my scenarios if it goes up, if it goes down, if it goes sideways, and if it's a trending or a balanced market. Okay. Okay. And well, JJ, what are your thoughts on people taking on mentors or people getting coaches and, um, you know, even someone like yourself, who I know who you work with people one-on-one, -on -one, what do you think is the optimal approach when having, you know, when looking to, you know, uh, being someone who's new, who's learning from somebody and also what's like your approach as, as the uh, mentor or the men, yeah, the mentor. Well, as, as somebody who, who has been in that position where I knew nothing, um, you know, in the old days, you know, I started before the internet, things like that. So you'd go to a, a, a big trader and go, Hey, you know, can I shadow you? You know, can I just, you know, can, can I come and sit next to you at work? I'll fetch coffee. I'll get lunch, those kinds of things. And that's how people used to get employed. You know, uh, they take a, a kid from the mail room or something like that. And, you know, the kid would show some promise because he asked some intelligent questions or he didn't screw up your lunch order as Turney would say in his book, right? <laughs> you know, like the lunch order is a big thing, you know, or the breakfast order because, you know, the yeah. traders will test you. They'll say, you know, there'll be like 10 guys and each guy will want something from a different restaurant, you know? Um, so you got to run around a lot. You know, they want to see how much pressure you can take before, you know, or, you know, are you going to deal with it and laugh or are you going to like freak out? Right, right. Um, it, it, it reminds me, it's like that football saying, like, you know, football coaches always say, if you can't handle like the fine details, Mm -hmm. How are you going to, you handle the bigger picture? You know what I mean? You know, so yeah, the, the, you know, the coming into it, uh, I've had a lot of really good mentors and 
what I did was I remembered the one rule, you know, we have two ears and one mouth, right? I would just sit next to them, keep my mouth shut and listen to everything they said, you know, and when they had time, I would say, Hey, can you explain that to me? Right. Um, you know, and, and that, that's how I learned these things. Mm -hmm. uh, now there are a lot of, I, you know, there are probably some good resources out there. I know, of course, I keep talking about Jim Dalton and Shadow Trader, but, um, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of good mentors out there. Um, you know, of course, once again, the proviso is, you know, with trading education these days is almost like the penny stock world. Um, there's a lot of people out there taking people's money and not really teaching them, you know, solid fundamentals or market mechanics so you have to do a little research just don't trust the first person you see mm -hmm. uh, talk to them read their materials you know i've you know i spent the last two and a half three years learning the es market and i'm still learning every day you know like mr dalton put, will put out a tweet or peter will say something on a weekend video and i'll be like oh you know what i forgot about that or i didn't think about that you know um mm -hmm. and it it always comes back around you know um, but I would, I would say it, it's what you put into it. You really, you know, the information is out there. It, it's not like in the old days we had to go buy a trading book for 300 bucks. Everything's on the internet now. All you have to do is let your fingers do the walking, right? And there's a wealth of information out there. Now you just have to be a little careful, figure out, you know, if you see a guy in the Lamborghini, you know, uh, sitting in a tree with a laptop, whatever, you know, you know, that that's marketing. But he's okay. in a but he's in a he's in a Lambo, JJ though. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, so were Crockett and Tubbs, you know, <laughs> um, you know. But <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that was a Ferrari. I stand corrected. Uh, uh, but you know, <laughs> hey, listen, you're in Florida. I've got to give you a Miami Vice reference. It also ages me. But um, yeah, no, you know, take take some time, do some research. Don't throw money at the first person you see. Right. Now, so, so JJ, let me, let's, let me ask you this. Cause it, like out of my own curiosity, right? Like, and I know we would probably agree on this, like, you know, people who give out just like trade alerts or people who are like, Oh, just like follow me and you'll make money. When we, we both know that's not the right way to go about things. You got to learn how to develop the trade plan yourself, learn how to do this yourself. And so your approach, when you work with people, like what's your like general, I guess, like theory, in like approach when you're trying to like teach somebody to get them to be, you know, self-sufficient? Well, I find it, if people have never done any kind of trading at all, it's wonderful because they don't have bad habits, mm -hmm. right? People who have attended trading schools and have gone to some of these sort of high priced kind of network marketing MLM type trading school things, they're harder to teach because they have spent a lot of money on education and they hold on to it. Even, you know, if, if it's, you can't really explain it. They're like, well, this signal says this, I've got to do this, but they have no idea what the underlying mechanics are behind the signal. And so they have to, they have to come into it with an open mind. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, coming into this market with an open mind will really save you a lot of time, a lot of frustration. And listen, I'm not, I'm not anybody special here. I, I came with, you know, 20 years of experience thinking I knew everything, right? Mm -hmm. Very quickly, I'm eating humble pie, right? And, um, you know, so I had to leave bad habits behind too. You know, you it, it's not, you know, it's not just somebody who's been to a trading school. I mean, I come off a trade desk and, you know, I mean, if I had a bad trade, I could get somebody to stuff it in an account for me, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't have to take the hit. Right. Yeah. We always had accounts like that. You know, there was always a promoter that had, you know, like a $600,000 debit. So you could st stick a five grand bad trade in there, you know, and he wouldn't care because, you know, he was just going to fill it up with zero cost stock and sell it anyway. So um, it was, uh, it's, it's very, very, because you, you do get a lot of bad habits when you work on a trade desk. If you listen to Turney and stuff like that, you know, he'd have Mr. Whisper tell him to, you know, call him and tell him that, you know, somebody's going to upgrade Amazon. I mean, there's really not a lot of skill in yeah. taking a long position off, yeah, right, <laughs> off yeah. a phone call, yeah, right? Be nice. Yeah. You know, so, you know, when you are used to things like that, it, it's, you know, so I'm no different than anybody else. It's just that my bad habits are different. Still bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 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 what is, what are your thoughts on special, maybe specialization in a market, a time of day, 
versus um, being, uh, you know, diverse as in trading different times of day, trading different markets? Well, um, see, and here, here's another thing that's interesting. I, I find a lot of new traders, they'll trade like three or four or five different markets because that's how they've been taught. Oh, I'll trade oil and oh, the ES is not moving. I'm going to trade oil because it's moving. Um, I trade the ES and the ES only. Now, with my clients, I will consult on block transactions if they want to buy or sell a block, and I can work that out for them. Um, I mean, I can trade a lot of equities simultaneously if I am the supply, right? Which means if I'm making a market in it. Right, right? which is a lot different. Uh, which is a lot different than being a retail trader, right? Mm -hmm. um, I find it relaxing to trade just one market, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not an adrenaline junkie, right? Um, so I don't need something to be moving fast. Like, you know, today the market was kind of slow. Yesterday it was kind of slow, but there are opportunities. It's, it's just taking time to develop. It's like baking a cake, yeah. right? They're putting everything together. It's in the oven. Just like, let it, you know, don't go stomping around on the floor. Let, let the cake rise. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see your opportunity because inventory you can take advantage of if someone's caught short, you know, like today, um, you know, you can see when the shorts are trapped. Um, so you just got to give it some time. Um, and, uh, and on that, the, the, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, well, you've been teaching me, but you don't, you, you're not, you haven't taken a trade. Well, it's cause I'm trying to explain the market to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, anybody can take a trade. You just hit the buy or sell button. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's not that tough, but you know, how, trying to learn how to see a market, and being patient and wait for those trades because the market literally, if you watch these TPO charts, they, they will knock on your shoulder and go, Hey, 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 you know, they're short, mm -hmm. they're short, they're caught. They're not getting filled. It's going up, you know, get long. Yeah. Right. It, it, after a while it, it's, it becomes that obvious. Right. Right. So not saying that, you know, don't use stops and I'm all right all the time, but you know, it, it, there, the, if you wait patiently, it will reveal itself. Right, right. And, and and what I would think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, what I think would be the practical approach is, you know, like you always emphasize really, and it's not just this podcast, you said it several times before, is learn what a market is first, learn why what's happening is what's happening, learn to specialize in one market. And then once you're like profitable, you're feeling good, then maybe you could branch off. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, there are people who trade all sorts of simultaneous markets. I don't know how the process, if they learn them all at the same time or specialized on one and learn the other. Um, somebody was showing me the silver market last week and it looked fascinating, but I, I don't know what drives the underlying price of silver, um, you know, I, or gold for that. I mean, I've mined for gold in Alaska. I've drilled for oil in California, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to trade it. <laughs> right. Right. You know, um, so it's, it's it's a different it's a completely different market the there are different you know order flow places there's central banks i don't know enough to to trade it i can look at profile and say you know i knew silver was going to you know march up the way it did the way it was acting but i didn't know what the underlying fundamentals were or any of that stuff or i don't really understand the market at all the only thing i remember is you know the great story about when the hunt brothers tried to corner the silver market in the 70s most people probably don't remember. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly not going to know that. Um, so, so anyway, let's, let's move on to a, uh, another topic, um, you know, which is similar um, and different. Um, another thing you hear, follow your rules. Um, so tell me how that differs from what we were just talking about. Well, I follow your rules for me. That's a simple one. Um, that one is my rule is don't lose money. <laughs> um, and, if, and if you do lose money, lose as little of it as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, and my major rule is respect your trading account. You know, um, don't take trades just for, oh, I'm bored. I'm going to take a trade. You know, mm -hmm. that's not respecting your capital, right? Unless you have an unlimited supply of money, right? Then be my guest, right? Uh, because my buddies on the other side, well, sure, they'd love to take it. Well, I'm right? sure, you know, I'm, I'm sure our listeners, if they're listening to this podcast, they don't have an endless supply of money, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know very many people who do. Yeah. Uh, but some people, but you'll see people with a $2,000 account or a $5,000 account trading like, you know, it's a $5 billion account and they're taking losses here and there and it's no big deal. Yeah. 
Um, so that that's my rule is respect your gunpowder, keep it dry, learn what you're doing before you go and put your money on the line. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and of course, you know, because the market's been doing the way has been the way it has been for the last 10 years, you just buy something and it goes up. So everybody's a genius. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it actually comes time to trade out of something or figure out what's really going on, you know, you better learn your stuff. Otherwise, you know, you'll get taken out to the woodshed. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, what are some of the, now, obviously that was your, your personal rule. Uh, when you encounter some newer people, what are some of the rules that you hear from them or maybe people who have been, who have like prior um, experience learning from somebody else? Um, well, they'll have rules on risk. They'll have rules on, you know, if, if the stock touches the eight day EMA or if it shows a, uh, cup and handle or they'll have like rules based on technical analysis things and they'll have rules based on indicators and um i don't really you know i never really got into that because i'm i'm kind of a break the rules guy um so uh you know i never really i never really followed that i mean i the the biggest thing was me was don't screw up and don't lose money right Mm -hmm. Uh, so learn as much as you can about what you're trading so you don't Right. And then use risk management. So you, you know, you, you are going to lose money trading. Nobody makes money on every single trade. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, take trades uh, where there are higher odds of that trade working, where inventory has got too short, too long. Um, you know, uh, take those trades where your stops don't have to be insanely large. You know, um, a lot of the times it took me a long time to figure out that, you know, the trades that I look at now, they work and they work pretty quickly um, because they've stretched the rubber band as far as they can go one way, right? And um, the profile will show you that because it's printing out where the order flow is. Mm-hmm. So so what would you say or what advice would you have um, on people? Because, you know, like you were mentioning, people, I think sometimes people get very like rigid with their rules, you know, like very strict, like, ah, uh, doesn't matter if it doesn't break below this, you know, uh, support or, you know, whatever indicators or they're using that, like, it's like they, they ride the stock all the way down. You know what I mean? And like, they're, yeah. they're so rigid. So, so like, what would be your advice on, you know, one, like being a little more flexible with your rules or like, how do they go about knowing when they need to revise the rules and that their rules are actually wrong? Well, that, that is, that is a function of sitting and watching price action, right? Like, you know, overnight last night we had a level, uh, I had a level of 3,001, um, and we hit it to the tick today. I, you know, I, I saw 29.90 and a half on the ES and we went one tick under it. Great. It's a level, but I'll say, oh, it's coming up to my level. I want to see how price behaves at that level. You want to see how price behaves. Do they front run that level? Which means, do they step in front of that level and buy it? You know, does that showing you that technical traders are in there, or if the other time frame or a big fund is coming, you know, to to you know sell large chunks of of some equity, they're going to blast right through that level. They don't care about it, right? They're working in order, right? So you want to see how price behaves around a level, or if it misbehaves, right? And that's going to tell you who's who in the zoo right? Mm -hmm. And how to govern yourself accordingly, right? So being rigid in this game, you know, I, you know, I I think if you want to be rigid, go into compliance, Hmm. right? Uh, Don't be a trader, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, you know, easier said than done. I, you know, just a lot of trial and error. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So um, and and I'm saying everything Folks, remember, when I talk about this mistake, that mistake, it's because I've made them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so um, so yeah, so right now we're going to uh, take a brief intermi- uh, intermission. Um, you know, not for nothing, this show is called Confessions of a Market Maker. So we're going to need the self-proclaimed uh, director of Dirty Tricks uh, to confess some of his market-making sins. I'm Father <laughs> Pauly Walnuts. <laughs> JJ. Oh, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Well, well, <laughs> one one of the things that we used to do is back in the day, uh, you'd always get, you know, how Turney had the Mr. Whisper call. We had, 
you know, somebody call and say, Hey, you know, they're, um, this stock is, is having a sellout, which means, you know, a promoter or a big client has bought a bunch of stock and they, they failed to pay for it and compliance is going to sell out the account. Now, when that happens, that depresses the stock. So you'll get a call saying, Hey, um, you know, ABC firms, uh, got a sellout on, you know, XYZ, you know, so we'll short it right away. You know, mm-hmm. we'll, we'll just go sell 5,000 shares, hit the bid. And then, you know, because the sellout's coming that, um, you know, uh, it's going to f- further depress the, you know, the price of the stock so you can cover. Um, there was a lot of stuff like that that went around, um, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's definitely one of them. That's definitely one of them, yep. All right. Well, I mean, I, th- I think for uh, your penance, JJ, I'm going to need three Our Fathers, three Hail Marys, <laughs> and uh, you're going to have to pray the rosary once. Oh boy! Okay. All right, and I, and, uh, I hope that uh, you better be back here next week because I know there's probably more than that. <laughs> oh yeah, well, you know, we have a lot of shows lined up. <laughs> I have a lot of sins. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's not let's not waste them all in uh, in the first time. Um, all right, so g- getting back on topic, um, the next um, phrase, I guess we could say, you, I hear, I heard a lot, and I'm sure you've heard it a lot too. Ninety percent of traders lose money. Um, I guess like, first off, is that true? And like, where does that number, is that number, you know, does that just get thrown around? Or is that based on statistics? Well, you know, I've only been doing retail trading for a couple, you know, two, three years and being on Twitter for the last half of this year, uh, actively, I, I tend to meet more people who have not made money or who are not consistent. Now, that being said, um, you know, you don't hear from the profitable traders because they don't need you and they're trading and making money. I don't know what the percentages are, but it would make sense that a large number of people fail at this because they really fail to understand the mechanics of what, you know, what they're up to. Um, it's kind of like trying to do brain surgery without taking basic anatomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what separates the, you know, and this might be a broad question and uh, hopefully you can like narrow it down for me, but like what separates the, um, the 10% that do succeed from the 90% from, you know, your estimation? Uh, for me, I think it's discipline, um, discipline to do the work, to learn the market, to watch the market. Uh, the discipline to sit on your hands and stay at a chop so you don't blow up your account. Um, a lot, so much of it is discipline. Um, I think the other thing too is, you know, people who are flexible um, mentally probably do better at this. Yeah. Uh, it took me a while to learn how to do that. Um, you know, because I would come in and I'm like, oh man, it's going to go down, you know, and you'd be, you know, but inventory would be short and you just get reamed. So things like that. Um, I, and I think it's just discipline, perseverance, the ability to say, listen, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, and, and go and learn. Um, you know, there, I think, I think too, like all the guys that I know who are like big traders are very humble, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we are all just one trade away from humility, and uh, and I, I think you know just to put your head down and do the work, and I also think if you enjoy it, it helps. Um, you know, because I love the market. I love. I mean, I find the I'm a Canadian, but I you know I I will listen to stock market stories, read books from the 1800s. Um, on, you know, on the deals of the day and how they were, you know, uh, they were run and things like that. The U S market is just a fascinating, beautiful machine. Um, and over the course of history, there have been so many interesting people involved in it and who shaped a lot of it. Um, so I, for me, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's something that I love, right. Um, and being on the retail side, I get to kind of explore things and figure things out. And I love doing that. So I, I think if you have, you know, if you don't look at it like a bank machine with a mouse hooked up to it, I think that also helps. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, that, that's a uh, good way to put it. I, I think, um, 
you know, at first, like when I was first learning too, like me looking at it like that, it was just like, oh, like, you know, cause you know, I always compared it to poker, you know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, it's yeah. not as, you know, you know, it's too technical. It's not as, you know, personal, et cetera. But when you, when you look at it more from that context, I think you're absolutely right. Um, and another question I want to ask you that, that I've, I've heard some people say too, in in poker, uh, we call this the rake, right? So the, the rake is, you know, the money that gets taken out of the pot. So the casino makes money, you know, for providing the service of running a poker game. So like in trading, um, you know, we're talking about the spread, you know, commissions. Uh, some people say it's like, oh, that's, they blame that on the reason why they're losing traders. Uh, what would you say to them, people that are blaming it on like commissions or the spread, et cetera? Well, the thing about that is, you know, people who blame the market for taking their money, um, obviously, you know, haven't spent enough time trading you know the market's not there as you know it's not a charity right it's not there to buy you your new bentley right the market is there so people can execute orders and um you know basically retail you people coming into the retail you are the exit strategy for people who have taken a large economic risk by taking these companies public Right. So that's why they're selling stock to you that is highly marked up. Now, that's fine. That's the business model. And that business model is conducted through market making or algorithms. Or There is always a whole side and a, re, a wholesale and a retail side to markets. Um, so people who blame things like spreads and market makers being evil and things like that, this is the market that has been created over the last couple of hundred years. It is a order flow based mechanism, right? There, the business model is that retail brokerage firms, you know, get paid for their order flow by wholesalers, right? And that is that's baked into it. That is the structure of the system. So it's not an evil thing. It's the system that you people have built. And it works really, really well. Otherwise, if you didn't have market makers providing liquidity, um, human or machines, you know, your spreads would be, you know, you could drive a, a truck through your spreads. You know, you stocks would be bid five, offered 10, right? And, you know, so when we have competition of different people offering liquidity, those spreads start to shrink. You've got pennies now. Right. I mean, uh, in the old days, they said they'd never trade for less than a kosher eighth. Right now, you know, you've got a penny spread, sometimes even less, you know. Um, so the guys who and the ladies who do the market making and the wholesaling also remember that they're taking an economic risk, too. They could sell you stock at one hundred dollars. And next thing you know, it could be at five hundred dollars a share, you know, and they're out they're offside and it hurts. Yeah. Right. So they're taking a, a serious economic risk by providing you liquidity to keep those spreads tight and they have to transact a lot, you know, to, to, to make a living. And, you know, they do make a lot of money and, but that's the system that's been built. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So on to our next topic, um, another common phrase you hear, do not play illiquid stocks. Um, and I guess first off, um, could you just explain to our audience if they're not uh, familiar with the term uh, liquidity and um, what does, you know, and what do you think about that um, phrase? Well, I, I definitely agree because the concept of liquidity is something that is very important to me. From the time I started out before I was a trader, when I sold advertising to promoters, Liquidity is the biggest thing out there if you are a finance guy or you're trying to sell something. You want the market to absorb a lot of stock in this case and not affect the price. So you need a liquid market and liquidity just doesn't happen out of the blue. Markets are built, right? Um, markets are built, marketing is done, products are offered. And that liquidity uh, is essential. Now, when you take a company that's illiquid, which means it's a company that, as we say, trades by appointment only, or trades less than a couple of million shares a day, um, you know, or, you know, the, the float is a million shares and it's held by a couple of people, um, those kinds of companies 
more often than not are a vehicle for dilution to happen. Um, from the penny stock world, you know, you would get a shell company and reverse merge, you know, your deal into it. That shell company would have no stock in the depository trust system. The promoters would have all the stock and they would introduce it as they brought buyers in. So the stock would be very, very controllable, very, very easily manipulated because you don't have to move a lot of it. That's what we call a clean shell, right? So when people look at a stock, you know, there, there was one example I looked at and um, I talk about this one all the time. Um, there was a deal back in 2017 um, and they took the stock from $4 up to 28 And, you know, the, the company only had, I think, uh, a very, very small amount of stock in the float. Um, and yeah, they had uh, 25 million shares in the float and they just kept adding stock to the float as the promotion went on. You know, and they took this poor thing from four dollars up to twenty-eight. You know, and there were two days that I took screenshots of, and one day that stock traded seven hundred million dollars in dollar volume. The next day it did four hundred and fifty million dollars in dollar huh, volume. Wow. So, you know, if I was trading something like that out for one of my clients who had financed it on, say, a convertible debenture or something like that, they would ask me two questions at the end of the day: What was the volume? Number one question. Second question, how much did I sell, right? They don't care about price, right? Um, the promoter has been brought in. That network has been brought in to move the price of the stock up to create liquidity so we can sell a lot of it, you know? So, you know, and you take a look at that company. Uh, nowadays, you know, they ran the thing up to uh, 20 bucks and it has never been up there again. It trades at $2.73 now. And I'm sure the float is probably 10 times what it was because they've dumped a whole bunch of cheap stock into it through dilution, right? So that's the problem with dealing, you know, trading these illiquid things. The other thing about an illiquid stock is they're very easily manipulated. So if you're on the wrong side, you can get hurt very, very quickly with one or two stray orders. Yeah, you get crushed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I know that's why you're a... Uh you know, a big proponent of uh, the micros and e-minis? Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the micro is where you learn, the mini is where you can bank, um, and it's liquid. It's one of the most liquid markets out there, you know. Uh, you can get in and out. The spreads are nice. The price action is beautiful. Um, you know, it, it's it's the perfect I, – I don't even know why. I mean, I, I, I don't day trade stocks at all because – if I did day trade a stock, I would have to know everything about a stock before I got into it. And if it's running, how am I going to do research in in the time frame that I need to buy it, know who's controlling it, know what the float is. Now, I know you can trade these things technically and, and not have to worry about all that, but, um, you know, or if I was swing trading them, that's even worse. I want to read their securities filings and see if there's an SB2 or a registration that just went effective where someone's going to be dropping 150 million shares of, uh, of cheap stock in, into the float. So that's why I like futures because it trades very technically. You can use profile and you get to know the market quite intimately. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Tra trading equities, I'm sure is going to just add some, you know, stress to your life that you are not looking <laughs> to have right now. Well, a lot of people you know, do it because that's the first thing you right. hear about. And when you honestly get into futures, it, people really don't make it easy. You know, even the symbol, you know, the symbol changes and the contracts roll over and like Microsoft is MSFT. That's it. Right. But you go to three or four different futures platforms and they have a different symbol for, you know, the December contract. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it, it, people are like, what? And then this. And so it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a little, there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. Right. That right. Way. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's well worth, you know, learning that stuff uh, to, you know, to sort of preserve your yeah, capital. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you think like, I, I know, I know obviously this is, um, you're not recommending this, but uh, have you known anyone that was that, um, you know, plays e-liquid stocks like as a viable option to make money? Like, have you known of anyone? Uh, 
No. no. Okay. No. I, I've never I've never met anyone who trades illiquid stocks who has made money. Um, I just I honestly that is like a unicorn. Um, I mean I'm sure they're out the people out there selling services who say they do. Um, and God bless them, it's a free market. But um, I don't I, I don't know any single retail trader that's come to me and said, look, I'm consistently profitable trading illiquid stocks. Um, yeah, never, never met one. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So that's going to wrap up our, that portion um, of the podcast. Now today, um, what we're doing, uh, we fielded some listener questions um, throughout the week. Um, this is something that we plan on doing uh, going forward. So um, listeners out there, if you guys have a question for me and JJ, I mean, really any type of question, we're taking serious questions, we're taking funny questions, personal questions, whatever. Uh, you guys go on Twitter, you can ask us. Um, and so, yeah, we got a list of today of questions from the listeners that we're going to uh, run through. Um, so um, we'll start off here. This one is from um, at Hollow Possum. Uh, I'd love to hear how market makers prepare for slash react to earning releases. Um, well, I would have to say that they would like to be as flat as possible so they can, you know, um, so they can be at risk one way or another without affecting their uh, net cap too much. Um, you know, and I'm sure that there are market makers out there who probably hedge uh, things and use options and things like that, but I'm, I'm not really that, you know, in the know of that, because I've never sat, you know, at a desk and traded Microsoft, you know, with order flow from E-Trade or, or Ameritrade or anything like that. But I would imagine, uh, because market makers job is to provide liquidity, um, that they would, you know, like to be as flat as possible so they could, you know, fulfill their, you know, their obligations. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would make sense. Um, and shout out to Hollow Possum for the question. Thanks for that. Um, all right. Up next, this question is from Kyle Motter. Um, question, how much of an impact, if at all, do central bank policies impact your trading or investment decisions? Or do you try to stay away from trading on Fed days when the Fed will speak or decide on the Fed funds rate? It seems like the Fed, ECB, BOJ, et cetera, have a huge impact on markets today. Well, they, they do, and that's because you know we're we're just printing money like it's going out of style. Um, I tend to be careful on Fed days. Um, you know, I might trade before the announcement a little bit if the market's trading very mechanically. Uh, once they, you know, make that big announcement and the big move happens, um, you know, I, I nine times out of ten I won't trade it um, because I, I'm more risk averse. Now, I know a lot of my buddies who do, and they do very well at it uh, because they have their levels picked out and, you know, on on massive swings, uh, even technically sometimes we'll tag those levels and come back in or retrace them. Um, so there are people who do it. I myself will not trade the announcement. I'll wait until the market kind of settles down and then, you know, then I'll, I'll get in there if I see an opportunity. But that's that's just me. I, I tend to be because I've traded through things like nine eleven and and all sorts of crazy things like that. I I tend to be a little bit more risk averse because I do have a lot more scars than most regular people. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, shout out to Kyle Motter for the question. Thanks a lot. Uh, this one is coming from at WGT. Um, what brokers are the best for trading the micros, e minis, futures, and uh, where do uh, where do JD where do you trade them with? Um, I like Amp Futures. Um, they're simple. They're cheap. They've got great day trade margin. And for the micro, they're charging me seventy eight cents round trip. You can't go wrong. Um, you can't even get a cup of coffee for seventy eight cents now. Um, yes, yeah, you know. Um, but Amp Infinity uh, Cunningham. Um, then there's another one, stage five. I, I only traded AMP and, and I've only been doing this for a couple of years. So I've been with AMP and I have no complaints. Um, you know, for newer traders, um, you know, of course, trading futures has risk and disclaimer and all that stuff. So be careful. But, you know, 
there are some firms that offer very, very cheap day trade margin, like $40 a contract or $50 a contract and, you know, small account sizes. And you can use something like Sierra chart. Um, so you can, your, your cost, your barrier to entry is small. Your risk is going to be smaller because if you blow up a $500 account or a thousand dollar account, you can make that money back as opposed to a $10,000 account. It just takes longer to make it back. Um, so that's one good thing, but always, always know that you are trading a product that is highly leveraged, um, you know, and, and keep that in the back of your mind, um, you know, just in case something crazy happens in the world. Sure. Sure. And shout out to WGT for the question. Um, next question from spy trader 24 discuss running stops myth or method. Um, well, uh, running stops is a great way to create liquidity. Um, you know, today was a perfect example of, of the ES uh, running stops. You could see, um, you know, say, say you're long, for example, a ton of stock, you know, at $50 and the market's kind of going back and forth and there's no really serious order flow, but, you know, Say, say you're a market maker and you've been buying this garbage from wholesale, uh, from retail all day, right? And your inventory is getting a little long. Well, now you've got to sell a bunch of stock that you've bought, you know, from 45 to 50, somewhere in there. If you start selling it, the retail is going to jump in and, and they're going to start selling and you're going to depress the price and you're going to lose all your money. So what you need to do is you need to spend a little money and run the stops. And look to where the short sellers would have their buy stop if that price was violated. You run it up to there. You take that stop out. And what that does is it does two things. The shorts have to go buy back. That creates one pool of buyers. And then you have retail chases because they see a breakout, right? So now you have created a nice pool of buyers that you can sell your position into. Um, and that happens all the time. Um, and the great Mark Douglas, if you watch his videos on YouTube, there's a four part series. He describes it, um, in really, really good detail. All right. Shout out to spy trader 24 for that question. We appreciate it. Next question from at N N S meter 21 more on market profile. Where does one find information on liquidity database? Uh, CTI one, two, three, four volume. I don't know what that means. All right. Um, like the liquidity database, I, I'm, I'm looking at structure. Um, so I, I'm looking at structure and I, I guess liquidity for him would mean where the point of control is or where most of the, you know, the most time spent, uh, the most volume traded. Uh, but the rest of that question, you know, if he emails back and breaks it down, we'd be happy to. And if I don't know the answer, because obviously I don't know what he's talking about, we'll find somebody okay. who does. All right. Yeah. Well, shout out uh, to you, NS Meter 21. Uh, get at JJ um, with the follow up. Next question from Jazz147. Do you use anything to watch dark pools or block trades? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I, I don't know where to even find information on dark pool trading. And I would not I would be scared to find out what the monthly cost of something like that is, or even if you have to have, uh, you know, if you have to have an institutional account to do that. Maybe there are retail people who do. I, I don't need to look at that stuff because I'll just look at structure. Um, I don't really need to get into the minutia of, you know, it's like some people will look and see, oh, there's huge offers on the DOM and, and that. And that's great if you, if you trade that way, but the, the TPO tells me enough. It tells me where it's printing out. Uh, the DOM can be manipulated. Um, you know, order books are supposed to be manipulated, right? Because you've got an agenda. You want to sell, you take it up. You want to buy, you take it down. Um, and I'm talking large positions. So I like to see what actually prints, right? What actually prints on the tape, where the transactions occur, how long they occur for, and what price. All right. Well, shout out to Jazz147 for the question. Next question is from Nate Lee, 1977. It seems like sometimes the algos slash floor traders run it up and then short it back down slowly. Are the same traders taking it up and down or are they, or are there really bulls and bears battling? 
Well, I, you know, like I was saying in, in a stop run, when someone's long and they blow the stops out on the top and create a pool of buyers, that's probably what you're talking about. And then, of course, you know, once they're out of their position, of course, you know, if they don't see that there's any follow up buying, they're going to take the short side of the trade and sell you as much as you want up high. And then they'll buy it back from you when you realize that there's nobody behind you to push it up. So that that is, you know, that is part of market making. That is a part of trading. And that is the system that has been built. And those are the rules You know, these people aren't, they're not breaking the law by doing these things. This is, you know, that's why they call it making, you know, market making. You're making the market to suit your agenda. Mm -hmm. All right. Shout out to Nate Lee, 1977, for that question. Next question comes from at Greg Trumbold. Thoughts on the fledging pot sector? Maybe it's a broader question about emerging industries, slash bubbles, et cetera how to navigate them. Um, Yeah, I I mean, I am a Canadian. I have not bought or touched a single pot stock. Um, And the only reason, I mean, number one is because I don't trade equities. Number two is most Canadian issues, and I don't mean to be disparaging of this country because I love it. And, um, you know, um, I, I love Canada, but some of these deals, you know, they'll introduce a deal and it'll be just like the junior mining section where there'll be no stock in the inventory. They'll run the stock from $5 to a hundred bucks. And next thing you know, they'll just throw a bunch of, of stock into the float. And, and, and that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's the game, you know, God bless, but I, you know, I'm not going to be going long or investing in these things, especially when you don't have earnings and that sort of thing. Or if you do have earnings, I want to wait and see, you know, how these things trade, um, you know. The also the the other thing too is Canada has a much smaller uh, population. Therefore, there's not as much retail in these things. And, and most Canadian people that I know don't day trade. Um, you know, they invest and they invest in long term and they invest with money managers or what they call RRSPs and things like that. So, I I find it very difficult. Um, you know, uh, I hope these people do well. But you look at a lot of these companies, you know, they they came out and it was tulip mania and they ran. And now, you know, now there's really no bid. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see whether or not, you know, the promises actually catch up, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And then uh, the second question comes from uh, Greg uh, Trumbold as well. Uh, Ways in which markets slash stocks are manipulated, how to tell when the game is at play and how to use it to your benefit. Well, um, that that's a tough one because you know, you know, people say manipulation, whereas somebody on the other side of the desk just calls it working mm-hmm. in order. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, so what you need to do is you need to understand the mechanics of the market. Right. If I want to buy a, a million shares of a stock for a client of mine. Um, I want to get it to him as cheap as I can, right, without running up the price. So he calls me the next day and gives me another trade, right, Um, because there's a thousand guys waiting for his phone call, right? I I am, I am, you know, I am, I'm not indispensable, right? I can be replaced in 20 seconds. So learn why the market trades the way it does. The market is based on order flow. Orders flow in and out of those markets and mark and professionals and wholesalers and people who work orders for large institutions, they have a duty to get them the best price. So it's not really manipulation. It's the actual functioning of the market. So you should drop all these things like manipulation and this and that and actually learn the mechanics, right? Once you learn the mechanics, you'll be able to understand, like, for example, today we opened up on a gap in the overnight and filled the gap. And I understood that they gapped the market up so they could sell into it. It was a distribution gap. You gap a market up. So what happens is you create buyers and you can sell into them. Right. Um, You know, and so learn about the markets. You know, if, if a market gaps up, do the internals support? 
you know, a continuation of that gap or do they say that, you know, it's going to come back in and fill the gap like it did today, you know, and then go back up. So it, you know, learn the mechanics of the market before taking on these blanket terms like manipulation and this and that, you know, learn exactly how the markets work and why they were put in place. Yeah. And shout out to uh, you, Greg Tremble for uh, both questions. Uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks again to everybody. Um, and if you guys got questions for me and JJ, like I said, anything personal, funny, serious, whatever, um, you know, get at us. Uh, we will be doing this again next week. Um, and yeah, that's going to wrap up today's podcast next week. Uh, we're going to be having on Steven Goldstein, uh, who's a well-respected performance trading coach. Uh, he's worked with some of the top firms on Wall Street. So we're definitely looking forward to that. Uh, JJ, any parting thoughts? Um, let's see. I'm just really, really happy that people are, are listening. And if anybody needs any help, I'm VWAP Trader one on uh, Twitter. Uh, reach out to me, DM me. Um, if you want to learn about micros or that sort of thing, um, I'm, I'm happy to help. I've got, you know, a small crew at the, uh, the pit trading.com that was happy to help too. Uh, you know, and the one thing is, uh, in these markets, um, keep your head on a swivel folks, because, you know, it's, uh, don't lose yourself in, in price, you know, just chill out and wait for the trade to happen. And while you're waiting, learn and uh, enjoy the learning process. And of, and of course, if you need anything, I'm always here to help. Wise words from the gorilla of House Street. And for VWAP Trader, for myself, uh, that's going to be it. It's going to be a wrap. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next week. All right. Thanks, Ray. Have a good night.